Good morning, church. Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 7. We begin in verse 18, Luke 7, verse 18 is where we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad you're with us. We're glad you came out in the rain. Most of all, we're glad you came to worship Jesus, and we feel honored that you would join us uh, in choosing the place to worship. Uh, My name is Mark. I get the privilege of being one of the ministers here at the church. And uh, again, it's just your encouragement to us, and we hope we can be an encouragement to you. Uh, We are in this series called The Gospels. We're taking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're synchronizing them together in the best chronology we can imagine. How did the events most likely or or possibly take place? And by learning that, we're learning the story of Jesus' life. And we're learning who he is and what he's revealing to us about his father, about his mission, and about our purpose being a part of his kingdom. And last week, if you were with us, I asked the question, what is the purpose of living life, of accomplishing titles and collecting things and developing relationships? What's the purpose of all of that if at the end of it you just die? If if all your work is left behind, that your name will be forgotten and your titles will be forgotten and your possessions will be distributed to other people to use or to sell or to whatever they do with it. What is the purpose behind that? And we looked at a passage in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus healed a woman's son who had died. There was a funeral procession and Jesus healed, brought him back to life. We talked about that the purpose behind our life is changed when we understand what resurrection power is. When we understand that Jesus came to bring life from death and to give us a purpose beyond just living in the moment until we die, that allows our death to be something that we use rather than that uses us. The power of the resurrection. Today we want to consider what do we do when disappointments frustrate us? When things don't seem to be what they thought, what we thought they would be or what we thought they should be. How do we handle disappointments? And let me take it a greater degree. What do you do when you're disappointed with Jesus? When Jesus isn't what you want him to be and he doesn't do what you want him to do. How do we handle that? So last weekend, if you came, it was a beautiful, just a gorgeous, uh, sunny summer afternoon. It was like 75 degrees. It was beautiful outside. It was amazing. And then I came in here and asked you the question, so what are you going to do now that you're going to die? And you all went, ugh. Now this week is just pouring down rain. It's a dark gray day. And so you're thinking, all right, and here I come raining on your parade again. But I'm going to tell you that life is disappointing, isn't it? I mean, seriously, I think of some of the best things in my life. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, I love being married. One of the greatest choices I made in my life was asking Heather to marry me. One of the worst choices she made, well, you can figure that one out. (laughs) But I love being married, and I love being married to her. But marriage is hard and really, really disappointing. Heather and I have have said this. I I just want to tell you, we've communicated to each other. It wasn't what we thought it was going to be. And we had to reset and go after what it could be. Parenting. I love being a dad. I've always wanted to have children. And I love being a dad to both of my boys, but they're inconvenient. I, true. Every parent knows what I'm talking about. When I want to be their dad, they don't want to be my son. And when they want me to be their dad, I'm busy. Or I'm watching a ball game for the love. It's disappointing, though. The moments I try to speak wisdom into them and they, they don't want to hear it. Or they want to do it their way. Or the moment I try to help them not go into the chasm that I fell down into and got hurt. And they head right for it. It's disappointing. It's not what I thought it was going to be. It's good, but it's just not, it's not what I thought college, man, best years of your life, right? What? Study? Being graded? In debt? Yay! Best years of my life. Not so much. And then I remember as a kid deciding what I was going to do. Now, I'm not doing what I thought I was going to do as a kid, and that may seem disappointing, but I look at it now, and I'm grateful for it. But for for a moment there, you know, I went, and I, all of a sudden, I was like, someone offered me a position, and I was like, you mean, yeah, you want me to be a part of your team? Yeah. And then I went there, and I found out it was a job. The reason they paid me is because they expected me to do stuff, show up on time, pay attention, be responsible. It was really disappointing. Because when I was 12 years old, you went to a job, so they give you money so that you go do what you wanted to do, right? You see, what I'm realizing as I grow older is there's a lot of disappointment in this thing called life. And it may not be in life, it may be in what we expected of it. So let me ask you the question again, what do we do when Jesus disappoints us? Luke 17, verse 18. If you remember last week, we saw Jesus heal, or not heal, resurrect a son back to a widow. And remember the community? 
related that back to Elijah because nearby, in a nearby town, Elijah had done the same thing centuries before and they began to relate to that and they said Jesus was a great prophet. And I said, you know, no, he wasn't the great prophet. He wasn't just a great prophet, rather. He was the, the one the prophets were talking about. And what he did was so much greater than Elijah. Verse 18. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all of these things. In the first 10 verses, he healed a slave. And in verses 11 through 17, he raised the widow's son. And the disciples of John run back to John the Baptist and they tell him what Jesus is doing. Verse 19. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one to come? Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? What do we do with our disappointments? This is John the Baptist, for crying out loud. He's the one who, when he saw Jesus come over the hillside toward the Jordan River, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. He knew who his cousin was. He'd heard the prophecies. He knew about his own birth. He knew about Jesus' birth. And yet in the moment and time, he says to Jesus, Did I miss it? Because you're not acting like I thought you would act. You're not doing what I thought you would do. Was I wrong? John the Baptist is asking this question. See, what do you and I do when Jesus doesn't meet what we want him to meet or be what we want him to be or say what we want him to say or do the actions we want him to do? What do we do with that? You see, if you're raised in the church, though, you suck it up. You swallow it. You don't ask those questions. How dare you write a psalm that asks who God is and what's he doing? Well, the psalmist did. But see, in the church, we try to hide that. How's that working? How are swallowing your doubts keeping you from doubting? How about the disappointments in life? How about just acting like they're not disappointing? How's that working? That's why Heather and I had to have conversations about, okay, marriage isn't what we thought it was going to be. It's a lot harder work and it's really difficult. And if you take a day off, it feels like you took a month off. So how do we build this thing? Here John sits in jail. Prophet of God. He did what God asked him to do. He proclaimed the truth. He proclaimed the coming king. He proclaimed a call to repentance from sin and from self-justification, self-righteousness, and to lean on Jesus and to trust in the promise of God. He did what he asked to do. He stood before a king and he said, your wife, you have an illegal wife and you took her immorally and unethically and it's wrong what you've done. And the wife said, put him in prison. And so Herod put him in prison. Herod had unbridled power. He could do whatever he wanted to whoever he wanted. He only had to answer to Caesar, and if he did it well enough, Caesar would never find out. There was no justice for John. Here he was in prison. Why? Because he did what God asked him to do. Sometimes God's intentions are to disappoint us. And while sitting in prison, he sends his disciples to Jesus, and he says, Are you or aren't you? Hmm. I'd like to pose... Two suggestions this morning from the text. First one will take a lot longer than the second, so don't panic. When Jesus isn't what we expect or want, what do believers do? Because you will be disappointed by Jesus based on your expectations. And when you are, what do believers do? See, John knew what Jesus, or who he was. But it's interesting that John saw what Jesus was doing and something didn't connect for him. Now, I'm trying to uh, reason and do some research to find out why John may have had questions, and I'm not going to get to all the possibilities, but the two that, that stru uh, struck me the most was, John never saw Jesus perform a miracle, and he never heard Jesus say he was the Messiah. Now, for those of you just visiting for the series, if you'll see behind me, the graphic behind me is intentional. The big blue piece starts really high, and, and that is the arrival that's when the God of the universe entered into our story, became incarnate, and lived in the flesh so he could suffer with us and, and lead us home. And then there's a, a down drop. It's a little pinkish. And this is where you get to the period of obscurity, where Jesus is born, but he, he has to go through the maturation process physically and spiritually and socially until he receives his calling by the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry. And then we're in this third piece of this whole called the recognition, where people begin to see through the miracles and the teachings and understanding of the Spirit that this is the Messiah. And this is where we're at in the story. And in the midst of all of this, John is frustrated because Jesus isn't doing what he thought he would do. How come Rome is still in charge? How come the Pharisees are still in charge? How come all of this injustice is going on? And I think deep down inside, John may have been saying, I did what you asked me to do, and look at me, I'm in jail. And John knows he's not getting out. At least I think he knows. 
He knows that Herod doesn't have to ever let him go. And what he said about Herod and his wife, he's probably not going to happen. And John is doing what you and I do too. By no means am I saying John's making poor choices. John's making human choices in the midst of human conditions. We do it too. I preach to this audience most every Sunday. Michael and I take the majority of of opportunities on this stage. And when we look out in this room, we see people who have been asking, God, I love you. I serve you. I'm trying to sacrifice for you. I want to trust you. My cancer is getting worse. We have people in this room who said, God, I've asked you to fix my marriage. I know I, I, know I did what I shouldn't have done. I, I know I, said, or I didn't say what I should have said. And I, I'm just asking you to fix my marriage, and it's going worse. People say, I've trusted you, and I did the right thing, and I lost my job. I wanted you to move. There are people in Houston, in Florida, crying out to God, going, you could have stopped that, and you didn't. I thought you loved us. There are people who have been harmed physically, been harmed by criminals, been taken advantage of, had their lives stole, uh, the joy of their life stolen from them, and they could cry out to God going, if you existed, you would have stopped that. You said you loved me. What do we do? Like John, when we look at Jesus and say, are you it or not? See, here's what I want you to understand. Jesus won't leave us without doubt, but he will give us enough to believe in. He won't cure every doubt you have. Your faith will overcome those. But he will give you enough evidence to prove who he is so you can believe in him. You see, the questions that John asked Jesus are not a threat to Jesus because Jesus is the Messiah. But you'll also notice that his being the Messiah will answer our questions too. Look at verse 21. And that very hour, Jesus cured many of the infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you've seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. There's something about Jesus that, if we're real honest, is disappointing. Did he ever answer John's question? Yes and no. All he had to say to John's disciples was, tell them I am. Tell them to be patient. Tell John to wait on me. But Jesus doesn't. He just does stuff. He just does what a Messiah said he would do. He looks at the disciples, he goes, watch. Guy can't walk, he walks. Guy can't see, he sees. Lady can't hear, she can hear. The gospel's being preached. People are being raised from the dead. Go tell him what I'm doing, and he'll know the answer to his question. And he does. And in the works of Jesus, listen to me carefully, in the cross of Christ and the empty tomb, John's questions and our questions find their answer. Look to the works of Jesus, and you'll know who he is. And when you know who he is, change your expectations. Because marriage didn't become what it needed to become until I realized what it should have been from the very, very beginning. And then verse 23 is amazing. Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And you think, well, you know, Jesus is a nice guy. And yeah, sometimes he doesn't do what we want, but he, he's a good guy. What do you mean to be offended by him? And the, the word that's used there could mean appalled, disgusted, repulsed. You hear what Jesus is telling us, church? I didn't come to do what you wanted me to do. I came to do what you needed me to do. And blessed is the person who lets me reveal myself to them rather than wanting me to become what they want me to become. Blessed is the person who lets Jesus be Jesus and we change rather than asking Jesus to change to become what we wanted him to be. See, we are in the recognition phase Probably the most common expression, I I love this, I'm going to paraphrase it, but C.S. Lewis is famous for saying the most common expression in heaven is going to be, oh, isn't that good? He's going to go, oh, that's why he did it. And I think the following expression is going to be, he's really good. Isaiah chapter 35, tell me if this doesn't sound like what Jesus just did. This is a messianic text, one of I don't know, I'll make up a number, 12, 15 I could draw from Isaiah that talked about what Jesus did. 
Isaiah said he'll do it. The Gospels tell us he did. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Wait on the Lord, John. Are you the one who was promised? And Jesus said, tell him what I'm doing and he'll have his answer. Luke 7, 24. When the messengers of John had departed, and that's one of those moments you look at Jesus and go, oh, come on, throw John a bone. But he doesn't. When they left, he began to speak to the multitudes. Now, be real careful here. I, I, I just thought of this a moment ago. When Luke uses disciples, followers, and crowds, he's telling us some different things here, or multitudes. He's talking to the general public, not the specific disciples. He's talking to the crowd gathered that day. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously apparelled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And I say to you more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, you, who will prepare your way before you. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. he. Disciples walk away and Jesus said, I want you to know John's a great prophet. John did exactly what he was asked to do. In fact, he was the greatest prophet because he got to give the greatest prophecy that the promised kingdom was here. Repent, make your hearts and minds right. Don't change your behavior, change your heart, change your way of thinking. Get ready for what he's going to reveal. And even John got caught up in what he's revealing isn't what I thought it was going to be. And Jesus said, he's a great prophet, but greater will be those who understand. Greater will be those who live out this gospel and present it. John's an amazing person, and Jesus honors him. Jesus doesn't make fun of him. This is the thing I want your hearts to hold on to. Your questions are real. And don't swallow them and act like they're not there. Deal with them. Doubt your doubt and trust your trust. But acting like you don't doubt doesn't make that any more real. In fact, it makes it worse. He honors John for asking. He honors John for seeking. He honors John for serving. Verse 29. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God. I don't know why that makes me laugh, but it does. Luke writes this. And when Jesus said that, people started believing, even those idiots. You know, those guys who cheat everybody. They figured it out having been baptized with the baptism of John. So what do believers do? That's the question I asked you. When Jesus disappoints us, when he doesn't turn out to be everything we thought he would be, what do believers do? Believers remember the promises of God and see them answered in the work of Jesus. They hear the promises, they see the evidence in Jesus Christ, and they follow Jesus. And when doubts come, when the marriage isn't fixed, when the cancer continues on, when you can't get a job, when your kids are in rebellion, when you struggle with all these things that you're begging God, when you want the storm stopped, and God does it differently, and God answers differently, what are we to do? Listen to the promises of God and see the work of Jesus Christ and trust him. That's what believers do. There's nothing wrong with having doubts. Unless you allow your doubts to ruin the evidence that Jesus came to bring us. So here's the other piece. doesn't take as long. When Jesus isn't what we expect or want, what do unbelievers do? Because you may find yourself saying, I'm a believer in Jesus, but there's no evidence from your choices that you are. You've just put Jesus on trial and you found him good enough. Instead of believing he's all there is, Luke 7.30, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. 
They rejected what God promised to do. They saw Jesus doing what John knew was promised. See, John knew what was promised. And then they, Jesus said, just go tell them what I'm doing. Because Jesus knew that John knew the promise and he saw the evidence and that would be enough. The Pharisees, they knew the promises. They saw the evidence. And instead of trusting in Jesus, they killed him. And we can do that today. Each and every one of us is capable of holding God in contempt because he didn't do what we thought he should have done. He didn't do it the way he, we thought he should have done it. Or he's allowing things to happen that we don't believe in. Instead of trusting in the goodness of a God who would die on the cross for our sins, we put him on trial over and over and over. Is he good enough and is he wise enough? And those who don't believe, don't believe. Hmm. Verse 31. And the Lord said, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? What are they like? This is, I was talking to Randy Garrison in the foyer a little bit earlier. This is one of those passages I never, ever preached on because I never, ever understood it. So instead of standing up here going, I don't know, I just glossed over it. I was forced by this series to process this text in particular. In context, it makes a whole lot of sense. So what shall I liken the men of this generation and what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned for you and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon. The son of man has come eating and drinking and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all of her children. Hmm. So what does that mean? Let me paraphrase it right down to its simplicity. Jesus said the problem with this generation is we're spoiled brats. John came saying, repent, this is serious. The judgment of God is coming. Repent and return to your father. And the crowd went, boo, too heavy, too harsh, too, too unloving. Jesus came saying, love your enemy, but there's gonna be a great celebration. I'm inviting you into my kingdom. There's a banquet and it's gonna be the choices of wine and the choices of food and God's love will be experienced. Come join this celebration. And the crowd went, boo, you're a drunk. You party too much. You don't take this seriously enough. And Jesus is like, really? You're spoiled brats. And I don't mean you're spoiled brats, but if you are, you are. <laughs> he said, I look at this generation. John offers you the kingdom, and you don't like the way he offers it. Jesus said, I offer you the kingdom with the evidence of the kingdom, and you don't like the way I offer it. You're rejecting me. You want the game played by your rules to your satisfaction. What do we do when Jesus disappoints us? We need to recognize we want it played by our rules to our satisfaction, and that ain't the game. Verse 35, wisdom is justified by all of her children. What does that mean? That means the wise will trust Jesus and prove to be wise, and the foolish will ignore Jesus and wish the deepest part of their soul one day they'd paid attention. Build your house upon the rock or the sand. Remember how he finished a great sermon? He says, wisdom is justified by all of her children. They trust this. They lead in this. You see, there's a misnomer out there. There's a misunderstanding about hell. People think that people are going to be sent to hell because God's had enough. He's sick and tired of it. And he just finally says, enough, I'm sick of you. Get away from me. No, hell is going to be full of people who told God to get away from them. God doesn't send a single person to hell. You choose it. And the hope of the gospel that Jesus is saying is, please don't choose that. And how do we not choose it? We follow Jesus. We take the promises of God in the scriptures. You see, from Genesis to Revelation, there's a simple story. God created man in his image to love and serve creation together with God. And we told God to leave us alone. And we broke our covenant with him and we separated ourselves from him. But God would not cease loving us and he entered into our story and he served and he gave message after message and promise after promise and he kept calling people to come home. Finally, he sent Jesus in the perfect day, Galatians 4, 4, at the perfect moment in history. There was no greater moment for this to happen. Jesus infiltrated our world. He became incarnate. He became flesh and he dwelt among us and he brought us truth and grace and joy. And he led us from the wilderness into the promised land. And he's been doing that forever. He's been loving and serving us. And many people say to God, leave me alone. And he will. But the destination is not what you want. It's not going to be satisfying. You're going to die once and then twice. But the hope of the gospel, what believers do is they trust the promises of God. They see them lived out in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
and they choose Jesus, I'm going to let him lead me. I'm going to open myself to the word of God. If you don't know what the promises of God are, that's why we beg you to open your day, to close your day, and to spend your day meditating on the words of God. If you don't know what the Bible says, you're going to be misled by our culture into what it says. Five, 10, 15, 20 minutes, I promise you, if you will build the discipline of reading the word of God, you will begin the discipline of hearing the voice of God. And if you're not doing that and you're letting me or some other teacher be your source of scripture, stop. You need to know. Hear God's voice for yourself and trust Jesus. What do unbelievers do? They ignore the promises of God so that the work of Jesus doesn't matter to them. They live in that in-between space where Jesus is available to me if I need him, but I don't know how often I'll need him. Jesus said, no, you have to die. You have to die to self. You have to crucify this life you're living safely and trust me completely. And then it says, you'll be found wise and you'll realize you made the best choice you can make. And those who don't, well, they don't believe the promises, so they won't evaluate the work and they'll be left with what they started with, telling God, just leave me alone. Just let me have my life, but your life will end in death. If you're not a believer of Jesus, now I'm not saying, did you make a decision historically? I'm asking you the question. Do the promises of God and the work of Jesus matter to you? If they do, go deeper and deeper and deeper into those promises and into the work of Jesus. Open your life to the scriptures so God can feed your soul. If you're not, no shame, but listen to me. You don't know what you're missing. You don't know the promises. There are so many of us here who would love to just share with you why we follow Jesus and why you ought to, too. You get to make the choice for yourself. But would you please consider Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done? Because it will change the whole line of your life. And without him, you're simply telling him, leave you alone. (laughs) Unfortunately, he will. And that will be the most disappointing choice you've ever made your entire lifetime. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is and you desire to have a conversation about following him, I'm going to be in the foyer in 30 seconds. Some of our elders and staff are going to be out there too. Have the courage to at least hear the promises and see the work and find Jesus to be not disappointing, but the most fulfilling, inspiring, and loving person you'll ever meet in your lifetime. If you need to have that conversation, please have the courage to begin one. Let's stand together.